Great to have you along for the ride. Really glad to have this guy here. His name is Harvey Lisberg. He is a, a well-renowned and he's a very famous manager of some great groups that you've heard of. And I just love getting away from politics, Harvey, and just talk about music. I'm a musician <laughs> at heart. It's just an absolute pleasure to meet you. How are you today? I'm good, thank you, Joe. Nice talking to you, and nice not to be talking politics. <laughs> it's good for me to get away to get away from it. He, as you know, and you're in the United States, right? Yeah, I'm in Rancho Mirage. Yeah, as, uh, as you know, politics engulf us sometimes. I'm so happy to get away uh, away from it. I am a musician. I'm a guy who's loved great music for a long time. And when I hear that somebody was a manager. It, it always really piques my interest because how exactly do you grab somebody who's got some talent that you think you can do something with and make them believe that you can take them to the next level? Is that hard? Well, I had success with my first act, which was Herman and the Hermits. Nice. I was writing songs like yourself. I played the piano and guitar. Beautiful. And I wrote songs and I intended getting those songs to artists. Uh, maybe the songs weren't that great. I uh, didn't get them to artists, so I decided to um, put an advert in a paper and get my own band. And then uh, they could do my numbers. Of course, they they didn't do my numbers. Well, they did the first B-side. Right. But uh, anyhow, yes, yeah, so I arranged uh, Peter Noon and, and the band were at Herman's, they were at Herman and the Hermits then. They played with this dance hall, Davy Hume. And... Um, I went there to see them, and they were playing the set that every group in Manchester played similar music. Okay. Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, I saw her standing there, whatever. And Misty Brown, you've got a lovely daughter, happened to be in the set, which was different to all the other bands, of course. Yeah. And each time their number was finished, the stage was charged. You thought it was the Beatles, and I thought I'd won the National Lottery. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, this is unbelievable. I subsequently found out that... Um, they planted people in the audience. Pretty smart. So it, wasn't that, it wasn't a natural reaction to the band. It was people charging it. And anyhow, it all worked out well. I went back to Peter's house, and uh, I, I'd sort of like to manage it. I was totally green. I mean, I was an accountant. I was doing ticking and adding and going out of my mind, as you can imagine. Yeah. It's the most boring thing you could possibly do. Well, well as, a creative, as, a, as a creative person, being an accountant can't be any fun, but it paid, uh, the, but it paid the bills. Let me, let me ask you this, a couple of things. First of all, Frank Sinatra did the same thing in the 1940s. They, they had women, that or girls, they planted in the audience to scream and yell, and then other girls around them that weren't plants were like, well, I guess we should scream and yell too. And that sort of built that, that, uh, that aggregate fan base. Is that uh, Herman and the Hermits, which became Herman's Hermits, is that what their plan was? Or they just thought it was kind of funny to have people acting like they, they were something that they weren't? No, yet? they heard that somebody was coming to look at them. Oh, who might manage okay. them. And a person that managed them in those days meant they bought the van and they helped with the equipment. And, you know, everybody was green. There was no, it wasn't a business where there were six stars and then we get the next one. At that stage, this was my first band. Wow. So uh, I went back to Peter's house. I played the piano. I did a bit of uh, Jerry Lee Lewis for him. And nice. he said, do you want to join the band? I said, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm here as the manager, whatever that is. <laughs> and but we got on like a house on fire. And then from then we went. The first job of the manager is to get a recording contract. Right. Meanwhile, the Beatles had exploded. Life changed just incredibly. Well, was was it exactly at the same time? Was it like 1963, 64, around well, there? No, 63, the Beatles had happened, but they were getting bigger and bigger. And, okay. they, were, and it was, they were monstrously big in 64 when we got our first right. record out. But we rec our record came out in August 64, but the prelim, I signed them in November before in six. So it took a while to get it going. And... Um, yeah, the, ma the job of the manager was to really look after people. I mean, you had to do everything. And in Peter's case, he was only 15. Oh, wow. But I had to go, when we came to America, having had a hit and everything that happened that way, I had to go to Bow Street's magistrate court, and I had to uh, sign as a guardian, because no 15-year-old could go and walk in America without a parent or a guardian. Right. And in London, John and Paul had been looking after 
Peter in the club switching lemonade for vodka. They were looking <laughs> after him when he was 15 in the jazz clubs and everything. So between us, we did a good job. No, that's very cool. It's, it's Harvey Lisberg. The name of the book is uh, I'm Into Something Good, of course, based on the Herman Hermits um, um, record. Uh, My Life Managing 10CC, Herman's Hermits, and many more, written by Charlie Thomas. It's a biography. So let me ask you this. When, when you got with them, was it was it just really good timing that it appeared as though, and correct me if I get this wrong, I'm not the expert you are, but it appears as though groups like the Beatles were unafraid to sing with their British accent. Uh, most everybody tried to sound American when they yeah, sang so rock and roll. Been, and it, we've been inundated. Well, I was born in right. 1940. Right. Ever since I can remember hearing music, whether it was Doris Day or from the first, or right. on and on, I heard American, American, American. Anybody that was English... Tommy Steele, Cliff Richard, people that had happened in England yes. couldn't get arrested in America. Nobody was interested. <laughs> and when the Beatles came, they were English, they had humor, they wrote their own material, and it was... I know the harmonies were like the other Yes. There was, they were not dissimilar to certain blues and right. uh, harmony, harmonic things, but technically they were English, they were from Liverpool, they had Liverpool accents. And they, then they gave themselves the image of the Beatles, haircuts right. and everything. It was a revolution. And, and, and they, 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 were, they were unapologetic about it. That we, we're British. This is who we are. They called it the British invasion for a reason. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. Herman's Hermits happens. And you certainly Peter Noon has an English accent when he's singing, which is great. It sounds perfect. Whenever I went into a pharmacy in America and I paid for the bill. Are you from Australia? No, I'm from England, actually. Uh, oh, stick around. We like to hear you talk. So you, you couldn't escape anywhere. Right, and right. Mrs. Brown was a quirky thing that was done. It was the last track on an album where Mickey Most was looking for a, an additional track. Right. And um, the boys had that in their act. They recorded it in one take. No separation between instruments. And they put it out. Amazing. And they put it on the album. And the American DJs picked up on it. It got phenomenal out there. And Mickey Mouse did not want to put it out as a single. Really? And they had to guarantee a million sales, prepay on a million sales before they allowed him to release it. Came in at number 12, the biggest entry in Billboard ever. Three to one. Four weeks at number one, keeping the Beatles' help off number one. So actually, for one month in my life, we outsell the Beatles. That's amazing. It is uh, Harvey Lisberg. He is a famous manager of great groups like Herman's Hermits, uh, uh, 10 CC. You also have a hand, and, and I've got to know about this because, again, as a as a guy who studied music his whole life, I I, I did plays, musical plays in college. I love my favorite uh, musical ever is Jesus Christ Superstar. How do you <laughs> how do you how do you run into Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber? And, and, and did, did you a... did you manage them or did you just help yeah, well, them? Well, I tell you, they they sent they phoned me up, said, "Can we come and see you?" And I said, wow. "Yeah, please do." Wow. And they came and they brought this song, "I Fancy You," uh, for Herman's Hermits. I sent it to Mickey Most, and he obviously rejected it. He rejected lots of other hits as well. Right. But um, I saw and I said, "Have you got anything else?" And they said, "Yeah." We've got uh, Joseph and the Dreamcoat. We're just in a musical. We've got a demo of an album here with Tim Rice singing Potiphar. Would you be interested? And I thought, great, a musical, the evangelical American Midwestern <laughs> everywhere. They will eat this up with that. Anyhow, I got this album and I said, can I put you on a management development deal, which I did for two years, and I paid them five pounds each a week, something oh, wow. of their right. right, something like that. And uh, I took the record to 15 different or more record company heads because I was powerful, so they took my calls. I didn't need to go to the boyfriend of the secretary's fourth cousin. <laughs> That's to cool. Get there. I love and it. And it was totally rejected. Wow. So my, I learned from that for any would be manager that if you want to be in a, as management, you better get used to rejection or it ain't going to happen. Anyhow, this song that they rejected became a number one for Jason Donovan. In, um, in, I'm trying to think when it was, it got a year later. Okay. And um, everything was great, you know. Well, 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 those two guys and their, the way they wrote music and the way that, I mean, it could have been classical, it could have been pop, it could have been modern. Well, what you see in Jesus Christ Superstar specifically, it, it's, I don't understand how two guys did that. I don't understand it. So how do you take something like that? Because I've, I've interviewed, um, you know, Ted Neely, the guy that played Jesus Christ, um, and, and, and the music was so incredible. A, a great singer like that had to sing it. But how do you get that out to the public? 
I mean, that is so specific. It's about Easter. It's about Christ. Uh, it, it's a it's a very religious thing that still well, has music that the it, end of my everybody could develop- every, everybody could enjoy it though. Well, at the end of my management development contract, two years, I had no success with Joseph, and they came to me and said, "Well, we're going to do an album called Jesus Christ Superstar." And I'm from the provincial North Manchester Jewish community, (laughs) which didn't support its members promoting Jesus Christ. Right. So that sort of tampered my mistake. (laughs) 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 It was, and they put the album out. So the album came out first, and then the album was a huge hit. Right. And then it became a musical afterwards. And I stayed very friendly with them, and. You know, even not, well, a long time ago now, Tim Rice wrote a song with Graham Goulman. Right. I had somebody in Magaldi and Evita. I've always, I mean, I spoke to Tim the other night. I speak to him regularly. He's a very nice person. Well, I'm guessing I'm guessing you stay in contact with people who actually helped you out along the way. Uh, and it sounds like you're that kind of person. It's uh, Harvey Lisberg. He is a famous uh, legendary rock manager. He managed Her- Herman's Hermits, 10CC, and many others. Uh, and, and certainly had an impact on Andrew Lloyd Webber and, t- uh, and, uh, and Tim Rice. Uh, I've got to ask you if you've seen the movie Elvis. Did you see the movie that came out last year, Elvis? I saw the uh, movie Elvis. Yeah, is that what it's it. like? Uh, it was Tom Parker. Uh, was he depicted as a, as a manager? He seemed to be overbearing, and getting 50% didn't seem to make sense. Is that really what it was like? <laughs> we arrived in Hawaii. Um, Tom Moffat was the DJ of K-Boy. And yeah. um, after a weary 30-day tour, we then got a telegram from the Colonel and Elvis. Oh, wow. We'd like to meet you and Herman's Hermits at the Polynesian Village. We're shooting this film. Would you come out to see us? And I went out to see him, and he greeted me. Oh, a fat Jewish, Jewish ex-fan. <laughs> I thought, great. That's a great start. But then anyway, I came to like him. He's been much maligned. I mean, he, he's an, he was an incredible marketeer. He's responsible for all the merchandising that happens today. Yeah. I don't know... Everybody that worked for Elvis, they never had a bad word to say about the colonel. Right. I never heard a bad word. The joke was that Elvis was there with bare midriff, no shoes, white trousers, and six people dressed exactly the same, with a hair, with a brocade. Right. And if he left, last they left. He fought it, they fought it. He was the <laughs> king. There was no, it was, his idea was he's so royal. Right. He's not going to, he's, he's a, in his shell, and that's, what happened, and then lots of things happened with the Colonel. One instance of his marketing, I mean, I think Elvis was playing Carolina or something to about, I don't know, thousands of people, and the forecast was for rain, and apparently the Colonel spent all the night before looking for an umbrella manufacturer that had a quantity of umbrellas available. Wow. The accent in the film was terrible. He never sounded like that to me. Well, no, no he, he did. He did not. I don't know why Tom Hanks did that. And I actually asked some people who are Elvis experts, why exactly did they make it so obvious? And I guess the filmmaker um, said, well, Baz Luhrmann said we had to do that to really bring home that he wasn't from here. But he he spoke like a like a Midwestern, almost Southern guy. He didn't he speak like somebody from. I, yeah. I said to my sons because we went to the house. It's a funny story. We went to see him about when he was about ninety two. My son's twenty first birthday, Paul, okay. and. Um, I asked my son, what do you want to do? He said, I want to go to Las Vegas for my holiday because when you're 21, you can gamble and you can go to casinos right, and everything. Right. So we went there and I phoned the colonel and I said, by the way, I've got my son here. Can I come bring them, Philip and Paul, to see you with my wife, Carol? And he said, well, I'm actually going to the dentist at the moment, but I'll call you back. Okay. I thought, yeah, right. And yeah, two hours later, he called back. Nice. I'm now in a panic because whenever I've met him, I'm in a long stretch wheelbase. And I've got chauffeur driven, God knows what. So I phoned up this firm and said, look, can you give me a, a stretch? Not a stretch, no, a Lincoln Town Car. It doesn't have to be great. Right. Just get it to me. This thing came. It was great. It had bullet holes all the way through the front, the back, the side. Wow. And we got to the colonel's house and I said, look, we can't park it. You park down the road. We walk down to it. And that was it. So it's very funny. Amazing. But, now, when you watch something like that, managers get a bad name. 
Elvis obviously had those hangers on that you said he farted, they all farted, I get it. And they allowed him, they enabled him. Instead of somebody being strong enough to say, hey man, knock it off, you're going to die at 42 if you don't quit. Um, the, the colonel was so wise in marketing, as you said, he's the guy that came out with the first I hate Elvis pins. Because he knew that half the people hated Elvis, half the people loved Elvis, Elvis should probably benefit from all of it. So as far as a manager goes, he did his job that way. But it's, but it's brutal, you know, it's brutal with MGM. Yes. He went to MGM at the end of the film and he said, do you know that watch that uh, Elvis was wearing? He says, uh, do you have written permission to use that watch? And they said, no. He said, okay, well, either you pay me $250,000 or you take all the f- shops with the watch out oh, of the film. Wow. I mean, he's tough. <laughs> I mean, he was really That's tough. That's pretty good. It's uh, Harvey Lisberg. Get his book. It's called I'm Into Something Good, My Life Managing 10CC, Herman's Hermits, and many more. It's written by Charlie Thomas. Um, I- I've got to ask you, as a manager, do you become the dad? You said Peter was 15. So uh, how much input do you have on what they're doing off stage and away from practice and away from making a record? Are you in their lives 24-7? Initially, they had so much to do. I mean, it was it was crazy, you know. I was involved, I had a partner at the time who helped and I employed other people that, you know, I always had to keep an eye on everything because there are always people in the background, the Alan Clans of this world who manage Mickey Mouse. So you can imagine, I had to keep my eyes on everything or I'd find my trousers had gone. But I just <laughs> needed to be, um, I had to be, I had to be aware of everything. You had to arrange everything. You but, couldn't but, physically but, do that yourself without help. But Harvey, everybody loves them. And by love, I don't really mean love, but they pretend they do. They want to be around them. They're hangers on, like you said. They want a piece of the band. Herman's Hermits is, is huge. 10CC is going crazy. How do, you, how do you keep them grounded? Because all the women want to be with them. All the money is flowing. All the booze and the drugs or whatever. How do you well, keep them on the straight and narrow? problem with the girls. That was a huge problem with Herman's Hermits. Because right. their average age was probably 18. So right. they weren't going out with 27-year-old women. Right. You know. Right. And we, the Arjo, what we did once, we were in a hotel in New York and Bob Levine, who's the manager, got one of these bullhorns and said, I've got reason to believe, Mr. Lisberg, there are underage girls in these rooms down the corridor here. Wow. And all of a sudden, all the doors open, people in different <laughs> stages of undress came flying out and running down the exit <laughs> the other way. So, I mean, but that was a problem. I mean, it was really was a problem. You know, we had to, as far as the drugs were concerned, I don't think Herman's Hermits were particularly involved in that culture. Good, good. I don't think so. They, they might have participated occasionally, but the, the main problem there possibly was drink. You know, nobody was fighting the drinking. No, I, I can imagine, especially, you know, you're talking 50, 60 years ago. That's that, I mean, back then, we didn't have all of the, the, the movement today about not drinking and not, and not getting hooked on that. We didn't realize that it was the disease that it is today. L- let me ask you this, because, um, and I want to be very careful with how I say this. You said you were born in 1940, and you seem to be more cognitively on top of things than I am. Um, it, it feels to me like you could go and manage groups right now. Do you? Are you still involved at all? I'm involved in the music more than the group itself. Okay. I mean, I think it's a different business out there today. It's not as interesting to me because everything is a merchandising packet. Yeah. You know, you've got a, a, an artist. They have to have a million streams before the record company, in their infinite wisdom, decide they might take a slight chance on them. So all the new writers have got virtually no chance of getting through. So I think it's a much harder business for a manager today. Well, I'm wondering, as a musical guy, and again, like I am, and, and you know, I, I was a professional musician from 16 years old, so I know what it's like to be out there a little bit. I was nothing near what you were managing, but but at the same time, you said something earlier that really jumped out at me that I loved, was that they were, they were laying down the music in one take, the singer with the drummer, with the bass, with the guitar, with everything, and they don't do that anymore today. And you can highly produce something and make it sound nice. But it doesn't. It doesn't have the feel of we're really playing this for you. That's really that's a big change, isn't it? Yeah, that was a fluke, by the way. I mean, that's not fair because all Mick, all the original records were produced and okay, you know, were produced. This was just a throwaway at the end of the okay. album, which they did. But the interesting thing is, Ten CC didn't care about their image. Their theory was we're going to get perfect music wherever we play which is very difficult in the theatres and yes. auditoriums, it resulted in them not really happening to the extent they could have done because they turned down an Eagles tour when, you, when 
I'm sorry. I'm not in love how do you with turn? Them. How do you turn down an Eagles tour? How do you do that? Because they, they only did one date as opening act, and that was the Nebworth date with the Rolling Stones. Wow. Because they because whoever's the headliner controls the board. Okay. And, and so, so, uh, so it, could, it couldn't sound like they wanted to sound. For those who are watching, listening, the board, you mean the mixing board, it's set correct. for the Eagles, and you're going to sound like you sound whatever through their mixer. Well, they've got control of it, and at Nebworth, the Rolling Stones are reputed to have interfered with ours. Right, right. So we, they couldn't hear their voices, and it's a four-part harmony. It's very tricky. Amazing. I mean, so, so they literally put their foot down and said, we're not going to go on this, this massive tour because we want to sound like we sound. It wasn't so much that it was just taken for granted. They just they refused. You know, they were they weren't they weren't interested. Well, right? good for you know what? Good for them. Yeah, honest. Uh, if they were true to the music, then good for them. As a manager, when somebody says I don't want to do something that you know could be lucrative for them, do you have to go along with it? Do you do you press them? How do you how do you do that? I manage Julie Driscoll. You might or might not know of her. I, I, I don't. I had a hit called "The Wheels on Fire." Oh, and, okay. Um, yes. She. Um, she came to me in 1967 and refused to work. Her fee went from 5000 to about 25000 She never did one date. And then she got an offer from Revlon to fly in two first-class tickets to New York to spend three hours doing an advert for Revlon. Wow. And she refused to do it because she didn't think it was right for girls to have to follow magazines that tell them to wear makeup. This is what can happen. <laughs> So it's, it's not usual. Well, well, well and, and the reason I ask about that, I'm so glad that you gave me that story, is because you seem so mild mannered. Yet you had to be ferocious to be able to call the president of the record company. So uh, I would imagine that when it came down to business, you were that guy. But but dealing with these different images and different you know mechanisms of their brains, it had to be so hard. I mean, you, you had to compartmentalize. You know, Peter Noon was this guy. You know that the 10CC people felt like they should sound like this. Tony Driscoll should sound the other way. That's got to be difficult. How do you juggle all that? Well, I think basically because of my upbringing, I was the first grandchild. I was, I was the first grandchild and uh, ruined by my parents, ruined by my grandparents. <laughs> and I had, as I grew up, I had this very social attitude and nothing bothered me. When I met Prince Charles, who was Prince Charles then, yeah. and he'd seen 10CC and I said, did you, um, did you, no, do you know 10cc? He said, no, I, I didn't know 10cc. I said, well, you probably know I'm not in love. Everybody said, well, knows I'm not in love. I don't listen to the radio, actually. I just listen to, on my way to Ascot, I listen to Radio 4. And I thought, here we are, the future king of England doesn't know the first thing about the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the British invasion. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Exactly. And, and, he's and, of, and he's of the age he should know all these people. Yeah, because I think they're a generation behind Yes. He was probably the Foxtrot and Waltz generation. You Isn't know? that something? But Diana sorted him out. Oh, yeah. Well, she knew who 10CC was. She was at, she, we, we saw a video of her at concerts enjoying and dancing like a normal person Travolta, would. Yeah. Exactly right. It's, uh, it's uh, Harvey Lisberg. I could talk to you for two hours, and I hope that you'll come back again. He's a rock manager. He's an author. Charlie Thomas wrote this book, too. I'm into something good. My life uh, managing 10CC, Herman's Hermits, and many more. Just one last anecdote, if you don't mind. How do you tell Herman and the Hermits they should be Herman's Hermits? It evolved because there were lots of bands. There was Freddie and the Dreamers, right. Jerry and the Pacemakers. Right. Um, every band was like that. And I think it was just a decision. Well, why not Herman Sermits? You know, it just, <laughs> it, it just tried to make it a bit different to everybody else. There was Sam, Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. You just name it. This one and that one. Going, and, and there aren't too many. Like I don't know if there are many with apostrophe S's in. I don't know. But... That, it, that was just purely the sound of it. And the question of the day, was there really a Herman? No, it was a, <laughs> it was a character called Sherman in the Bullwinkle show. Really? Which apparently, Peter, when he did Mrs. Brown, he used to put these black glasses on that looked like Sherman. <laughs> and he was, kept, went from Sherman to Herman. This was before my time. Went from Sherman to Herman and so forth. It evolved. It wasn't any particular person called Herman. I think that's great. Uh, uh, Harvey, do me a favor. Will you come back again? Anytime. I would love to have you on again because I'm sure we just we barely scraped the surface. Go and get this book. I'm into something good. My life managing 10 CC. Herman's Hermits and many more. Um, it's available now on Amazon. Just go to Amazon and look it up. Look up Harvey Lisberg. L I S B E R G. Harvey, thanks a million. Thank you so much. Very nice talking to you, Jim. All right, we'll See talk you. soon. We're back okay. after this. Stay right here.